Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Timon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Paul Bananos, Director of Biopharma Intelligence. Selena Couch, Executive Editor. Lauren Martz, Executive Director of Biopharma Intelligence. On today's podcast, a biotech IPO gets out, and it's a big one. How did a seller in manage one of NASDAQ's largest debuts amid this bear market? Denonimab data in Alzheimer's lifts Lilly's valuation by $26 billion, but will it be the amyloid therapy of choice? And digital endpoints are gaining momentum, but are they ready for prime time? But first, looking for a powerful new partner to accelerate breakthrough cancer research at cancer research horizons their business is breakthroughs cancer research horizons is the innovation arm of cancer research uk one of the world's largest private funders of cancer research with access to 400 million dollars of world-class research and the expertise of 4,000 researchers and clinicians cancer research horizons has formed over 60 startups and helped bring 11 drugs to market. Cancer Research Horizons is looking to partner with pharma, biotech, and investor partners. Find out more at cancerresearchhorizons.com slash collaborate dash us. Late last week, we saw the biggest biotech IPO on NASDAQ in years as Acelerin raised $540 million. The market's been pretty cold for some time. Paul, do you think this is a sign that a change is going to come? Mm, good question. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and, you know, to answer your question, I think the answer is uh, maybe. Um, there's reason to be cautiously optimistic. But I want to point out the company that's doing this, Acelerin, is really a bit of an outlier when you look at all the companies that have been watching and waiting for a while. Yes, they raised the most cash for a biotech on NASDAQ since Sana's uh, offering in 2021. It's a top five biotech offering on NASDAQ in, in the past, you know, half decade or, or longer. And they upsized by a lot. Remember, they were targeting about $350 million in this offering, and they got a lot more. Plus, they gained value the first day, up uh, around 25%. So it's not a bad sign for sure. But why do I say they're an outlier? Well, there's a few reasons. This was a private company that was already in late stage testing for multiple indications. And it has phase two efficacy data, really proof of concept data, and two of those indications. There aren't too many companies like that that uh, are still private and are testing a late stage asset. I mean, if you think about when IPOs were, were going nuts a few years ago, a lot of them were preclinical. Most of the rest were in the early stages in the clinic. And Acelerin is not that. Their lead molecule, it's called Izokibep. It's an injectable protein about a tenth the size of a MAB that inhibits IL 17A. It's in development for. Hydrodenitis suppurativa, psoriatic arthritis, uveitis, and axial spondyloarthritis. Mouthful there. And they've already shown proof of concept in the first two, HS and psoriatic arthritis. As for how they got here, it's a young company launched in 2020, not long ago at all. They raised a lot of private capital. Uh, I think it's about 400 million. They, they actually announced more, but I think they never drew the last tranche from their last private round. Um, and the lead molecule is Okebep is in licensed from a Swedish company called Affibody. So it's not something they discovered themselves. And that's really how their business model works. They find assets that already exist that they think can address unmet needs, mostly in immunology. That's their area of expertise. Some of them probably have been de-risked somewhat. And then they tailor a development program to move them forward. They actually acquired another small company to pad the pipeline with a few more assets as well. So that's different from a lot of biotechs that do their own discovery and have a longer timeline to advance programs. Moreover, their leadership has this amazing track record. The CEO, Shaoli Lin, was at Avi as they built their immunology franchise. Some of the best-selling drugs out there are in that franchise. And also, um, she helped develop uh, Tepeza at Horizon. That's the um, somewhat of a surprise blockbuster for thyroid eye disease. So yeah, this is a company that's been very well-funded has done what they set out to do so far, uh, generated strong proof of concept data, moved into pivotal studies. And if you were looking for a biotech that could build the case to go public right now in a market that's been pretty dry, 
this would be one of very few. It'd be right near the top of the list. Are there others on that list? Mm, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be taking a look at that, I think, very soon. Paul, what I'm hearing is that on the one hand, you call this an outlier, but on the other hand, every single thing you described is, in fact, exactly what we're hearing. So they're more an outlier because they are a recipe for success than anything else. They've got late stage data. We've talked all the time about having data, 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 and late stage data is better. They're in a very growing area, sort of certain areas of immunity, autoimmunity, information. And, you know, those are hot areas where investors see a lot of, I guess, follow on indication potential. And, you know, the other thing you talked about is a management team. So they may be an outlier, but that just might mean that the number of companies, to your point, Selena, the number of companies with the right recipe is actually quite small. They definitely tick a lot of boxes. Um, and, and if there are going to be more that, that uh, manage to get out soon, I would think that they would tick most of those boxes, if not all. How do they compare with the other couple of companies that raised significant IPOs this year? Well, let's see. There are only two really substantial ones on NASDAQ this year. Structure Therapeutics, which is a metabolic company that's also in the clinic, and Mineralis, which has a late-stage hypertension program. Um, so yeah, both had clinical assets. Um, Mineral Mineralis is a little bit later. And yeah, that those this was a much bigger offering than either of those. Like I say, it's it's up in in Moderna and Sana range, really. Sana's bigger. But um, if, if they fulfill the um, over allotment exercise, they would actually surpass Moderna's offering, I believe, into the um, $615 million territory. Yeah, but Moderna was, was, not, was Moderna preclinical when it went public? Oh, no, they had many programs in the clinic by then. I, I want to, the number I'm remembering is 10 clinical programs in a 21 program pipeline. Is that right? Does that ring a bell? That does ring a bell. And that was, uh, that was five. Five years ago, twenty near the end of 2018. Well, in your story, Paul, you had this list of top 10 NASDAQ IPOs and, and Acceleron was, you know, at least in the top half. But his post-money valuation, I think, might have been the lowest. Anything, I don't know, worth saying there? It's a very large float. The, the only thing I can say, you know, I, I don't have any specific intel on this, but um, that might be tied to just the outsized demand for this. They they weren't planning to float such a large amount, but with demand coming in so high, sometimes it's hard to say no. If you can raise more, you do it. Um, you don't know when the next your next opportunity is going to be. Especially in these times, the bear market is grinding on. You can find more of our bear markets coverage on the Hot Topics tab on our website, Biocentury. Dot com. Well, thanks for that, Paul. You'll be keeping an eye on the IPO market. I will. And so we'll uh, hopefully see some more activity. I know uh, it's been a while, to say the least. I had my eye on the on uh, looking for S1s on Friday evening. No one uh, no one jumped out uh, right in the wake of Accelerant. But, you know, a lot of companies file Friday nights. There's no reason you have to, and you can file any time during the week. But we'll be watching to see how that queue fills up, if it does. All right. Well, also last week, anti-amyloid monoclonal antibody Denonimab from Eli Lilly met its primary and secondary endpoints in the Phase three Trailblazer OWLS-2 trial. Or should that be ALZ-2 trial? Well, I'll leave it to Selena to let you know and let you know what she thinks about these data. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I mean, I think... The first thing probably just has to be said is that it denonimab has now shown in phase three what it promised to show in phase two. And now we have both denonimab and Lakimbi showing that the amyloid hypothesis does have some utility. It's not the whole story, but there's utility there. But on Friday, the the conversation seemed to I just seem to see a lot of people concluding, okay, if physicians are comparing these two and saying which one should they give to their patient, well. Denonimab has better efficacy, but slightly worse safety. And so that's the trade-off. And so it seemed to be widely concluded that this is the, the better efficacy data, but I didn't read the data that way. So the thing that stood out to me and what Lilly did that was so clever in its trial, and they'd get a lot of credit for this, um, is that they used a dual 
PET imaging strategy to biomarkers to kind of triangulate the patients who would be the most responsive to the therapy, which is I didn't do. So they're kind of taking neuroscience one step closer to a precision medicine approach, which is a place it needs to go ultimately. And this is the beginning of that. So they looked at people by their tau status, how much tau they have in the brain, and they put them into low, medium, high groups. And they said, okay, anybody who's in that really low, they have almost no tau, we're not going to enroll them into this trial. Not that they wouldn't get benefit, but they're unlikely to progress during the trial, which it's going to make it impossible to measure a treatment benefit, right? So then they were just looking at intermediate tau and high tau. And they honed in on intermediate tau as this like Goldilocks kind of zone where the disease is progressing enough to measure a treatment benefit, but they're not so far along that they won't get benefit for something that treats one of the early drivers of the disease, which is amyloid. But they enrolled both kinds of patients, both intermediate and high, and they did measure them both. But the primary analysis in this, is in this intermediate group. And what they found there was that across their efficacy endpoints, they did get slightly higher um, efficacy, more of a slowing of that decline than you see with, with lecanemab in its trial. But you know, if you look at that, that larger population across tau status, the data were almost identical. And ASI just didn't look at its patients that way, right? So actually, I think if you look at the broader data set and compare the two, are quite consistent in the amount of efficacy they deliver. It's like 27 to 29% slowing. But if you can get rid of those high expressors who are not as responsive, then you can get a little bit better efficacy. So that's really saying this giant population that's so heterogeneous, here's one way of taking another cut. And I think if, you know, if Asia had done that, they probably would have seen the same thing. So Selena, what you seem to be indicating is that first of all, Lily constructed their trial very well. And that is, you know, credit to them. But I'm sort of wondering how much that's going to translate to the broad population. It seems that, you know, once it's marketed, it seems that that requires a fairly detailed, is that the right word? I'm not sure. Level of analysis of, you know, you've got to have the right amount, intermediate level, and how much does that translate to clinical practice? Right now, it won't translate at all, right? Nobody's getting tau pet imaging. So it, it's not that meaningful for, for clinical practice in the near term. Um, I think from an efficacy, efficacy perspective, if you don't know what your tau status is, you've got to think these are similar drugs. And then it comes down to safety and, and convenience. Lucanumab looks to be slightly safer. Lily's drug looks to be slightly more convenient. It's not dosed quite as frequently. When you can know your tau status by a blood marker and that's routinely accessible and that correlates with the PET, that'll be a different story. But we're, we're not at all there yet. Like the, the blood-based biomarkers that people have been working on for diagnostics are kind of trying to find the disease early, right? Which is a slightly different thing than this buildup of the deposition in the brain that Lily was by trying to find the right amount of in his trial. So like there's work needs to be done there. So just staying with the future for a moment, I have just come off a call with a few investors, in fact, from different firms. And I have to tell you, I mean, there's fair optimism now about investing in neuro, in particular in neurodegeneration. And many of them are citing the positive data in Alzheimer's from Biogen, from Lilly, from others. These are private investors, so they're usually thinking about the next level innovation. And a lot of talk about the idea that there's going to be obviously a need for combination therapies. So what are your personal thoughts on this? And as I said, since it seems to be quite complex to get the trials right, is this an area that you expect to see a sort of surge in at the, at the early end? And what might be the caveat? Uh, well, okay. So with combination trials, first of all, I guess one of, those big, one of the big unanswered questions is, are you going to need to see single agent activity in the would-be combination partner? Right. We saw that we went through this in cancer with the big blow up of the IEO. And we don't fully answer that question. So that's one, one thing. But, but you know, I, I've talked to people in, in the field, people at Biogen and whatnot, who say, well, you really want that. You need to know what dose of this new agent is going to be effective. And so you've got to find that dose by finding 
the efficacy as a single agent before you want to go ahead doing combinations, which, you know, makes some sense. The other thing that factors into this is how widespread will these amyloid agents be? Are you just going to have to accept them as background therapy? And the jury's still out yet on that, right? Um, we need CMS to revise its national coverage determination and cover them more broadly. Not only that, physicians would really want their patients to get an amyloid PET scan. And right now that's not covered either. So that would have to get revisited. And then there's just not that much capacity and know-how at the places who see these patients for doing PET imaging, for instance. This could be a very long ramp up. You might not have to assume that everyone's going to be on one of these right away. And then the other thing is safety, of course, when you're combining agents. So these amyloid agents have some, some real safety concerns. All right. Thanks for that, Selena. Uh, Selena's story, of course, up on biocentury.com. I'd like to turn to digital endpoints now, something we've been hearing a lot about, the promise of in the past few years. Uh, there's been talk about how they're poised to address some of the biggest challenges in clinical trial design and pipeline strategy. Lauren, you've been chatting with various heads of digital at Biopharma's as well as the team at Dime. What did you learn? So based on those interviews and some digging around in, in the very nice library of digital endpoints that's provided by the Digital Medicine Society or Dime, I think we can say that use of digital endpoints is on the rise. But at this point, I think that these are sort of most useful for many drug developers as internal decision-making tools. So digital endpoints have a lot of benefits over endpoints that are measured with more traditional tools. First of all, you can measure different things than you could measure with standard tools. You can get more reliable outcome measures because you're able to track patients possibly continuously and, and see how they're doing in their normal life versus how they would be doing during a moment in time when they're visiting a doctor's office. So for companies, it's the fact that you can gather a lot of data from an individual patient. That means that you can run smaller trials and that can enable you to make sort of go, no go decisions on whether you bring a program forward at less expense, potentially you know, more quickly. And there, there are sort of no barriers to being able to use these as secondary or exploratory endpoints in that setting. So there, that is, I think, where digital endpoints are, are gaining the most traction now. I also think, and I've also heard that there's more to be gained from these if they become more commonly used as endpoints that can support regulatory approvals. And in that setting, I think there, there are more potential benefits. So the big one is the ability to decentralize trials, which means that you could, first of all, there's another big cost advantage because there are less in-person visits, but also more trial diversity. You can include different participants in the trials than you would be able to access near major medical institutions. So Lauren, what are the main challenges preventing use for regulatory decision-making? I think one thing is just the fact that it's hard to get new endpoints in general into the regulatory process, and these are new endpoints. But specifically for digital endpoints, on top of that is, is the fact that, well, number one, these aren't very standardized. So um, as I learned from speaking with the people at Dime, there are just hundreds of endpoints measuring a few different aspects of, of a patient's life. So, you know, there needs to be some way of sort of balancing the need to standardize these in a way that both the endpoints themselves and in the tools that, that measure them and the analytics that are used to interpret the data that you're getting. Balancing that, some standardization with the need to make these endpoints sort of fit for purpose, which is the real advantage of, of being able to use digital endpoints. And at this point, there is FDA draft guidance um, on the use of digital endpoints, but it's just still something that I don't think has been completely worked out. Lauren, so it does seem from, you know, your very, very interesting article that a lot of the innovation is being pushed by device companies, but presumably that will have a knock-on effect to some degree for therapeutics companies as well. Do you just see the agency getting more familiar with the idea of digital endpoints and, and then breaking ground that way? Yeah, I think that's I think that's probably the case. The more these are used in general, the you know, the more familiar the agency will become with them. 
And that's absolutely right. I think a lot of the endpoints in Dimes Library are for digital devices. And in a lot of cases, these devices are also being incorporated into therapeutics trials and it's all connected, I believe. Well, it's a super cool story and a really important one because I sort of think that you made the case that companies are using these digital measures or digital endpoints more for internal decision making than they're being used yet for regulatory approvals. So that's sort of a an area that the um, field still needs to develop in, which I think is is you know an area that we'll certainly be watching. And I think there's a lot more that can be done within the internal decision making. I mean, you're really seeing like if you look at how Lauren did this analysis in her story, where she grouped these endpoints that are being used into functional categories, and it's almost all movement and sleep and a handful of other things, which means there's only a handful of indications where they're getting that benefit of being able to use them for internal decision-making purposes. I mean, this could be much more widely used for that purpose before you can get to the regulatory part. Yeah, that was an interesting part of my discussions is is where these could be used, even places where you wouldn't expect it. Like oncology trials are always going to be about measuring tumor growth and, and things like that. But, you know, this is a great way to measure patient reported outcomes, and that's becoming increasingly important in drug development. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that one person uh, pointed out certain gas GI indications where they expect to see this like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and things. So that that was pretty interesting. All right. And we recently had the CEO of Dime, Jennifer Goldsack, on our sister podcast, The BioCentury Show. You can go to YouTube and check out that interview with our Washington editor, Steve Usden. Now, our most recent guest on The BioCentury Show was former J&J executive and incoming CEO of Fog Pharma. He sat down with Simone last week, Matai Mammon. Simone, uh, takeaways from your conversation? Yeah, Jeff. I mean, I think one of the common themes across the conversation with Matai was how he sees the importance of precision medicine across many fields. So for immuno-oncology, I found particularly interesting in the context of what we're seeing broadly He talked about immuno-oncology entering the hard work phase or companies or the field entering the hard work phase. And, you know, we've seen a little bit of pulling back in terms of investments and so on. And I think it's really more a case of now understanding where immuno-oncology is going to work. And he said, you know, precision biomarkers in that field doesn't really exist in a high stringency way. He thinks there's a lot to uncover still with T cells, the way different T cells will operate in efficacy and also unwanted side effects. I asked him a little bit about not just neurology, but neuropsychiatry, which is a sort of area of high end need where we haven't seen a lot of activity. And again, he emphasized the importance of precision medicine there, which is an area where the, he thinks, and I've, I've heard from several people, is probably the way that 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 area is going to develop going forward. He also brought in, when I mentioned that, he brought in uh, infectious disease. He thinks there's opportunities there to really make a difference and grow investments based on precision medicine. And, you know, he talked about the fact that if you're just using all comers in trials, you're always going to be doomed commercially because you're going up against very, very cheap generics. So to show you know, non-inferiority against a very, very cheap generic is just not a, a needle mover, but you really have to go for superiority trials. And that means going for selected populations and using precision medicine. So I would say that was the common theme, but it is always, a, he's a big thoughtful person, industry observer. So always entertaining and interesting to listen to him. Yeah, he, he really is. And uh, again, up on uh, our YouTube channel, and you can also find the conversation on our website as well. Next week, uh, special editions of BioCentury this week. We take the podcast on the road to the 23rd annual BioEquity Europe conference. That'll be in Dublin. You can still register to attend the conference digitally. It's otherwise sold out. Our podcast Monday and Tuesday will feature partners from Gilda, Isios, and ND Capital, 
as well as Jeremy Skillington, the CEO of Pool Bag Pharma. And Stephen Hansen and Josh Berlin will join as well. And we'll have some uh, takeaways and uh, hallway chatter from Dublin for you. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. Uh, Lauren, Simone, Paul, Selena, thanks for all the thoughts and insights. We will catch you next week.